Good afternoon. I'm Teresa Harvey, President and CEO of the North Orange County Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to our conversations with community leaders. Today we'll be discussing the challenges and opportunities facing cities as they deal with the implementation of Prop 64, the initiative passed by voters of California allowing for adult use of marijuana. Before we begin, two quick things. If you have questions, put them in the Q&A and we will certainly try to address all of them. And then for perspective, I wanted to give you a little historic overview of how we arrived at Prop 64. Cannabis has long been part of the discussion for Californians. In 1996, California voters passed Prop 215, the Compassionate Act, Use Act, the first voter approved state ballot initiative for medical marijuana in the United States. This initiative allowed qualified patients and approved caregivers to possess and cultivate medical cannabis and ultimately led to the formation of collectives and cooperatives to serve medical patients throughout the state. In 2015, the legislature passed the Medical Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act a series of three bills that created state licensing and regulatory system for the existing marketplace. In 2016, the voters passed Prop 64, the Adult Use of Marijuana Act. And under Prop 64, adults 21 years and older can legally grow, possess, and use cannabis for non-medical purposes with certain restrictions. Additionally, it made it legal to distribute cannabis through a regulated business as of January 2018. In 2017, California legislature passed a budget trailer bill, Senate Bill 94, that integrated the bill to create the adult to create a medical and adult use cannabis regulation and safety act. And this is currently the regulatory system that governs the medical and adult cannabis industry in California. Today we have two speakers representing members of the North Orange County Chamber to discuss the opportunities and challenges. As we begin today's conversations, I remind you to put your questions in the Q&A. We'll also monitor the chat should you put them in there. So to introduce our speakers today and get right to it. Sounds Chad good. Wonke was born in Anaheim and has lived there his entire life in the North Orange County area. He currently lives in Placentia with his wife, Lonnie, and their four children. He has lived in Fullerton for 15 years, attended Troy High School and Fullerton College, and graduated from Cal State Fullerton. Go Titans. Chad has served on the board of directors for several local nonprofit organizations, including the Fullerton College Foundation. Chad is an expert in municipal cannabis policy and is a regular presenter for trade associations, universities, and community groups. He has presented to BizNow, the Building Industry Association, and DEF CON to, be, to name a few. Several municipalities have used his expertise and his wife's white paper on cannabis selection process and has presented a model to cities all over California that they can use in their review process. Chad currently serves as the Mayor Pro Tem for the City of Placentia and has been on City Council for over 10 years. Prior to his election to City Council, he served as the Mayor, or as the tra City Treasurer for two years. Chad, welcome. Hi. Hi, Teresa. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, it's a pleasure to represent the Shrine Group as a member of the North Orange County Chamber. Appreciate everything that you do for the businesses uh, here in North Orange County. Uh, you've been a great leader, and I am uh, sad to hear about your retirement, but happy for you, and uh, hoping that you have a great time. Okay, so I'm going to run through just for the for everyone in attendance a little bit of basic information, but I'd like to focus on um, how legal cannabis impacts communities, um, how it can impact a city like Fullerton that doesn't currently allow cannabis. Uh, most cities in California were put in a position where they, they had to either uh, allow cannabis or explicitly prohibit it. Otherwise, it, it would be allowed and default to the state guidelines. So the League of California Cities recommended to um, its members 
that cities would basically default to a prohibition, and that's currently the situation in Fullerton. So the city council and the city staff have been reviewing ways to approve cannabis in Fullerton, and I'll focus on um, some of the basics about cannabis for those who aren't familiar with it, um, and then impacts really on businesses in Fullerton and um, you know a little bit of the process. And then Aaron being the attorney, I think is gonna go more into uh, specifics. So cannabis is a growing industry. It's currently allowed in 34 states and two territories for medical use, and 15 states, two territories in Washington, D.C. allow adult use. In 2020, we had several other states uh, that are moving forward with adult use. And by adult use, we mean recreational. So you do not have to have a doctor's order for it. Um, in polling, nearly 70% of Americans believe that cannabis should be legal. As far as economic development goes, um, as of January 2020, those are the, the most recent numbers we've got. The American cannabis industry directly employs more than 250,000 people in full-time jobs, up 15% from 2019. So it's a, it's a sizable industry. Cannabis consumers um, are in primarily uh, the biggest growth that we've seen has been in, in seniors. Um, Cannabis use is increasing across all adult age groups, but specifically among women and baby boomers, I've seen the largest increase. And um, after legalization, large numbers of seniors have embraced the use of both CBD and THC products. So those would be recreational and medical uses. And today cannabis is available in a variety of forms. Um, those could be smokables, which people may be more familiar with, which would be uh, bud or the flower, you can see that in the lower left corner. There are waxes and resins um, and other uh, manufactured products that can be used to vape. There are also edibles, uh, such as gummies, uh, beverages, and baked goods. We all joke about, you know, space cakes and brownies and things uh, still hold true. And there are topical products like lotions, balms, creams, and a variety of other products that people will use on hurting joints and um, you know, skin problems. So there are a variety of uses and ways to use cannabis today. Actually, there are so many of them, it's kind of mind boggling. Health and research um, is an area that's been limited in the United States because of the classification of cannabis. But the FDA, FDA has approved THC-based medications for cancer treatment, um, epilepsy and associated syndromes. Uh, some of these names are mouthfuls. I'm not even going to try and say them, but um, nembixamols combine THC and CBD, and they're available in a lot of the rest of the world for multiple sclerosis. Um, in states with medical cannabis laws, opioid overdoses have dropped by an average of 25%, which is pretty significant considering the impact that the opo opioid addiction crisis has caused for cities and for businesses. Um, and again, the, the research in the United States is limited because of the classification of cannabis. So cannabis is currently classified at the federal level, the same as heroin, crack cocaine, um, and other drugs. That doesn't jive with the public's perception of cannabis. There is an impact on crime. Um, studies show that the opening of retail locations correlates to a significant decline in crime in the immediate area. <clears throat> that is. Uh, we don't know the exact causation for that, but when you add in 24-hour security personnel, cameras, and lighting, you tend to get less crime. So some of the security measures that uh, dispensaries will use, you'll see listed here. Uh, most cities require video surveillance. Oftentimes that surveillance uh, can be tapped into directly by the police department. So anytime the city can, uh, can see what's going on on site. Uh, the security guards are present 24-7. Um, the dispensaries also use multiple ID checks. They have enhanced exterior lighting and they work closely with law enforcement. They're also, uh, the loading and unloading docks are much more secure than you'd typically see at another retail type location. So when you add in all of these improvements and these security enhancements, it makes it a lot less favorable for the average criminal to go into that particular strip mall or location and commit crime. So especially the, the lighting and the security guards. 
most businesses and most strip malls at three o'clock in the morning, there's nobody there and it can be very dark. So the economics and, and, and jobs, the cannabis industry added 64,000 jobs in 2018 and 33,700 jobs in 2019. The median cannabis salary is uh, 58,000, 10% higher than the US median salary. Um, at the Shrine Group, uh, we are a UFCW union shop. All of the uh, employees are paid a living wage. They get benefits, and we also offer uh, paid education through Santa Ana College. Santa Ana College is our current partner in Orange County. Um, the American cannabis market supports more than 250,000 full-time positions. And these are jobs that are directly involved with handling the plant. So you have a lot of peripheral jobs. Uh, you know, you, when you bring a cannabis business in, you've got employees that now have uh, an income. So they will shop at other businesses. They'll buy gas. Uh, the, the people that are coming to shop at the stores will do the same thing. So that's a difficult to measure, but you do have some trickle down economics and peripheral sales tax generation and, and other benefits, especially in employment. With the impact of COVID on the economy, uh, both on businesses and on personal income, cannabis can be one of the few ways that cities can bring in new jobs that pay a living wage and have benefits and uh, kind of backfill the losses that you might have had from, uh, from COVID. It's also a way that vacant storefronts or other businesses can get filled up. It's not good for any city to have uh, vacant businesses or vacant buildings. Uh, I think we're gonna see more vacancies in the future with the impacts of COVID and, and the shutdowns. And again, cannabis is one of the few businesses that has a demonstrated track record of success so when a city approves cannabis, um, you know that there are going to be businesses coming in and those businesses do employ people and they do generate tax revenue for the city. So it's a, it's a sure thing. Santa Ana brought in approximately 4 million in revenue in 1718 and approximately 9 million in 1819. So community investment is a large part of the industry. Uh, we call it conscious capitalism. Um, and investing in the future. So we will partner with uh, local community groups. Uh, we make an effort to hire from the communities that our uh, lo retail locations are located in. Uh, you know, if a city is going to approve a location, uh, it's good business and good policy to do your very best to hire from that community. Um, you can't discriminate against people based on where they live when you're employing, but local hiring is important. Um, our workforce development program and career development program provide employees with skills to uh, take their job to the next level if they want to. They can get business certificates, and training, software training, and uh, really improve themselves and improve their ability to, to earn a living. Uh, some, of, some of the community partners that we've worked with in Orange County, most recently we, we dropped off uh, personal protective equipment to several nonprofits at Fullerton, and they're able to use those to uh, for food drives. Uh, these are this is hand sanitizer, masks, and gloves. So not only can you provide these to needy families where they might have somebody that's sick and no way to protect the rest of the family or the household, but also these allow the community groups to safely distribute food and other goods that, that people need. So I'm just going to glance over the, the licensing process. Aaron's going to get more into that. But the licensing process allows the city and the community to really review the applicants, uh, decide what works for that particular community, and get high-quality operators. Um, some examples of the criteria that cities will use are the business plan, the financial viability of the, of the operator, their economic development or labor plan, and the safety and security plans outline what might happen in a fire. Uh, they also outline what security measures are in place to protect not just the business, um, but the you know the structure when it, after hours, um, the people that are that are coming to the business. And these safety and security plans are far in excess of what you would see from a similar business like a liquor store. 
Um, I like, I think of cannabis as, if you think of cannabis as an intoxicant, uh, the concept really isn't new. We have in existence breweries and distilleries that produce alcoholic beverages. We have distributors that distribute those. We have retailers that retail them. And what we're looking at now with cannabis is bringing in a similar model. The difference is that because it's cannabis um, and there's still that new factor, cities tend to really go overboard. Uh, if you can walk right into a liquor store right now and they don't have um, you know, a guard, oftentimes they don't have the safety and security plan that you'll see with uh, retail dispensaries. Um, they'll also look at neighborhood compatibility based on the location. And then good companies, good operators will have a community benefit and investment plan. How is that uh, cannabis operator going to interact with the community? How are they going to be a long-term partner um, and provide more benefit than just the, the tax revenue that's going to come into the city? Uh, opening a new cannabis operation like a retail store is expensive. The average price is around $2 million, and that can go up significantly based on, you know, the structure, what kind of tenant improvements need to be done, and, you know, whether the requirements put on them by the city, uh, the security and safety plan um, can cost quite a bit just to implement the security cameras and the other measures to make sure that, you know, people are being checked, that ensure that everybody meets the age requirements uh, to come into the dispensary and that everything's safe. So these are not inexpensive to develop. And some cities who haven't gone through a good licensing process have ended up with operators who weren't able to open. And it's in the cities, especially Fullerton's best interest with the current financial situation to get high quality experienced operators with a demonstrated track record of success so they can come in, open up quickly and start generating tax revenue for the city. That tax revenue can be used for new roads, policing, um, whatever the city council decides needs needs to be done or what's the highest priority. All right, so taxation in the illegal market. Um, some municipalities have uh, implemented extremely high taxes and that results in increased prices at legitimate retail stores and the black markets in those areas tend to flourish. Um, in 2015, more than 100 unpermitted cannabis dispensaries operational in OC. These can pop up. It's kind of like whack-a-mole. One of them pops up, you, you take it out, and another one comes up. And it's oftentimes very difficult to tell who owns these and, and who to actually go after. Santa Ana has permitted 19 licensed cannabis retail stores and has been able to shut down most illegal operations. Cannabis companies uh, that are vertically integrated can offer lower retail prices, and those, those lower retail prices can oftentimes put the black market out of business. Um, when, when they're available, consumers prefer to shop at legal retail stores. This is because the products are all tested, and the product quality is higher. They're also safer and uh, more comfortable for people to, to, uh, to go to. So well-run, vertically integrated cannabis companies can price the illegal market out of existence. And that, that's a desirable thing. Uh, you may remember that there were the vaping crisis. Uh, there were a lot of vaping products that weren't safe and hadn't been tested and that were causing health issues for people. That doesn't happen with the legal stores, but it can happen with the illegal. Uh, locations, um, the zoning is really commercial versus industrial. Some cities only allow uh, cannabis uses in industrial or manufacturing areas. Other cities allow them in both. Um, retail stores and commercially zoned areas generate significantly more annual revenue and more taxes for the city than those located in the industrial zones. Um, industrial zones are less desirable for the public. They typically have less parking and there's also typically more crime, so it makes it more expensive for the operators. Sensitive uses and buffers, Aaron will get into, but those are the distances between sensitive uses as determined by the state and the city. And a buffer is how far away a cannabis use is from that sensitive use. Um, those can be measured several ways. You can measure it from the edges of the parcel lines, um, which makes it much more difficult. You can also measure it door to door. And some cities take into account physical barriers like freeways or drainage ditches, and they'll measure how far you would actually have to walk 
to travel from a sensitive use to a cannabis uh, retail cannabis location or other cannabis uh, business. And that's a really a much more practical and realistic perspective. So vertical integration is when a company has the ability internally to grow process, uh, manufacture the, the manufactured cannabis pro, uh, products, distribute and sell cannabis from seed to sale. So there's a major pricing advantage versus the illegal market. Um, you can see on this map, it's just a sample um, for the Shrine Group of cultivation, distribution, manufacturing, and retail locations. There is an issue, an issue right now in California where you have 10,000 cannabis licenses issued. There's 9,700 that are active. You have 6,258 cultivators, but only 723 retail. So you have a lot more being produced than is able to, to get to market. So there is a dramatic need for retail locations, and those can generate a significant amount of revenue, especially for a city like Fullerton. Fullerton's a good location. Um, it's unlikely that some of our surrounding cities are going to approve it. Um, Anaheim's looking at it. Stanton's in the process right now, but it's unlikely that Placentia or Yorba Linda will approve it. Uh, La Habra allows distribution only. So all of that pent-up market demand can flow into Fullerton, and Fullerton gets the benefit of the tax revenue. That's uh, the end of my presentation. Um, I don't know if you want to take us to take questions now, or we'll do that later on when we're all talking. Yeah, thank you, Chad. I think we'll go ahead and let Erin present, and then we will continue with some questions, but really appreciate the background and, and certainly the insight on the vertigo integration and some of the other complexities. Erin Hertzberg here is an experienced cannabis and regulatory attorney with documented track record of success. In 2017, Mr. Hertzberg founded the Puzzle Group Law Firm to aid the cannabis community by providing legal advice on commercial cannabis and licensing and, com and compliance issues. Since founding the Puzzle Group, Mr. Hertzberg has assisted numerous clients in the acquisition of over 1 million square feet of licensed cultivation space in Los Angeles, California. Concurrently, he has managed investments for more than $80 million into the industry. He also regularly serves and advises clients on all aspects of government affairs, licensing, and transactional matters. Mr. Hertzberg, welcome. I look forward to hearing from you. All right. Well, thanks, Chad. Um, and that was a fantastic overview. Um, so in California, we have um, an interesting system. I think I'll swap around between slides a little bit. Um, what we have is a scenario where um, California under Prop 64 legalized recreational cannabis. And prior to that, you know, we had legalized medical cannabis. And we have a scenario where um, under state law, it's generally allowable, but the state leaves it to each municipality, to each city, uh, to decide what, if any, of the activities that are part of the cannabis business will be allowed in each city. So these are the types of activities that are allowed or that, that are the general types of businesses or licenses that are allowed under state law. And each city uh, makes uh, a decision. Most cities uh, currently uh, actually have, have banned uh, the cannabis use. So this is a relatively, the, towards the end of 2019 chart of cities within California and you can see that um, a vast majority of cities don't allow any kind of cannabis activity at all whatsoever. Um, uh, you could see, for example, as of the end of 2019, 99 cities allowed cultivation, but 376 did not. 98 allowed distribution, 109 allow manufacturing, 85 allow retail stores, and 118 allow testing. Um, so there's still about 390 or perhaps at this point, maybe 380 or 75 cities in California that expressly prohibit 
any kind of cannabis retail sales. And um, thus, for example, in Orange County, as we speak, and I'm gonna flip back actually to this map. This is a map of Orange County. And this, uh, let's cover some of these cities. Right now you can see that currently the only city that allows retail dispensaries in Orange County is Santa Ana. Um, and Santa Ana back in 2017 allowed uh, a lot, had a, conducted a lottery and allowed 20 operators and then subsequently another 10 to apply for retail stores. The only licensed dispensaries that are allowed legally under state laws in Orange County right now are based in Santa Ana. Any other retail storefront that you might encounter, and, and I'm sure you've driven by many, are all illegal, unlicensed shops. And that's part of the problem that, that we have uh, in California, just uh, a, a, a large proliferation of unlicensed pop-up shops that are competing against the licensed marketplace. Um, so to cover some of the cities, Santa Ana allows all uses. It in includes, you know, the, the uh, retail stores, the dispensaries, as well as manufacturing, testing, and distribution. Um, uh, Costa Mesa currently allows manufacturing and distribution under Measure X. Um, and they are currently considering, or Measure Q was a voter initiative that passed, and they are currently implementing uh, retail dispensaries, uh, which should, you know, a process that may very well take the rest of this year. And, and I'd be surprised if we see any retail stores in Costa Mesa until next year. Irvine allows testing laboratories. I'll talk a little bit more about what those are. Uh, Stanton is in the process of licensing retail dispensaries um, and that's underway. Um, Fullerton is considering retail dispensaries um, and I know that's of interest. Uh, and uh, La Habra currently has deliver, uh, sorry, La Habra currently has distribution uh, and menu, I believe just distribution facilities, correct me if I'm wrong, Chad, and they are considering uh, non-storefront delivery. So that's currently the status of the cities in Orange County that allow retail or non-retail uses. And that's where each city is entitled to make a decision as to what uh, what uses are allowed. And assuming that they uh, don't allow the use, uh, they, they have expressly prohibited any kind of cannabis businesses, which is the case. So in California, this is sort of the chain of, of, of the types of, of, of uh, or the chain of, of the supply chain, so to speak. Um, the first step is to cultivate cannabis and it's a flower, it's a plant. Um, and so it can either be grown uh, indoors uh, in a hydroponic type of grow uh, situation, um, which uses a vast amount of energy or um, it's grown outdoors in large uh, outdoor grows, whether it's a greenhouse or uh, out in open fields. Uh, there's a significant amount of security that's required. So even if you have an open field, you need to have it surrounded by, you know, barbed wire and cameras and other forms of security. And um, currently a lot of the, a lot of uh, the cultivation in Southern California is predominantly dominated by indoor large warehouse grows um, in Los Angeles, in some of the cities um, like Linwood and Maywood and some of the other warehouse cities south of Los Angeles. And then there's a large scale greenhouse production of cannabis um, taking place in Carpinteria and Santa Barbara County, where you have millions and millions of square feet uh, of greenhouses producing cannabis, as well as outdoor grows. Um, 
and also Salinas in the salad bowl sort of area, Monterey County is another hotbed of, of cultivation activity for, for greenhouse, which is much friendlier uh, to the environment and much cheaper to produce than taking an indoor warehouse and trying to grow a plant inside of it. Um, as far as the next step, once it's harvested, cultivated and harvested, it then goes uh, to a manufacturing facility, whether it's simply the raw flower as a plant or whether it's turned into a, a product such as a vape pen or a concentrate or a tincture, uh, a drops that you might ingest um, uh, or, 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 or any other form, all cannabis in California needs to be pre-packaged by a manufacturer. So if you buy a joint, the flower, the cannabis flower goes to the manufacturer, the manufacturer produces the joint, they have to package it in childproof packaging. There have to be warning labels and uh, it has to, the packaging uh, is similar to a prescription drug bottle. It, it makes it challenging to open. I can never open them myself. The, the next step sort of is mixed together. The manufacturers then use a distributor um, to distribute the product. Um, both in terms of transporting it, but also in terms of sort of a sales network to get it out to the various stores. And the distributor is responsible for testing the product. The lab, the, 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 the labs that test cannabis test it for its potency, how much THC, how much CBD and the other, THC is the psychoactive component and they break down uh, the strength and, and the potency, but they also test for adulterants, they test for uh, pesticides, they test, uh, there's a very, very, very strict control and very, very few uh, pesticides are really allowed uh, to be used. So cannabis currently uh, that's being supplied through the license chain is very, very safe because every uh, product uh, is regularly tested and uh, you can uh, you know, be pretty assured that there's, that there's no pesticides and there's no mold and there's no other uh, toxic chemicals in the product. Um, and then it gets distributed uh, through the distributors to the retail dispensaries. Each one of these levels, by the way, can be taxed by the local municipalities. Um, and some of them are taxed by the state as well. And so there's taxation that's assessed at each one of these levels and it compounds. So by the time the product gets to the retail dispensary, um, it's usually been pretty highly taxed. And then the retail dispensaries pay uh, both state tax, um, ordinary sales tax, as well as most cities impose a municipal tax, typically between four to 7% that's collected at the retail level. And that's how cities are able to um, gain uh, substantial um, tax revenue um, through the sale of, of cannabis. Now that in addition to the retail storefronts, there are also delivery services and it turns out that you might ask how I live in a city like Newport Beach or Costa Mesa or something that doesn't allow currently for retail storefronts. Notwithstanding that under state law, companies that have a, the permission to deliver may deliver anywhere in the state. And so oftentimes uh, individuals that live in cities that don't have retail stores are still easily able to get cannabis delivered to their home uh, in a legal manner. Um, these are the types of licenses available. As you can see, for cultivation, there are numerous classes of licenses um, from outdoor small uh, to mixed light, which would mean a greenhouse. Um, to outdoor, purely outdoor, which is in a field uh, and indoor. And each of these have uh, 
limitations on the amount of square footage that you're allowed uh, to cultivate. Um, then there is a manufacturing type six license, which involves manufacturing of cannabis products, not utilizing volatile chemicals or explosive chemicals. Um, and type seven, which involves volatile chemicals. Um, so uh, oftentimes solvents that, that, that are a fire hazard are used. Um, it's a very safe process if it's done correctly uh, with the correct precautions, but um, uh, so that's why there's sent, some cities will allow for non-volatile manufacturing and others allow for the type seven volatile manufacturing uh, where butane and other solvents are used to, to extract the THC and the psychoactive chemicals uh, and the CBD from the plant into a concentrated format. Type eight is a testing laboratory. The testing laboratories have to be independent from the other businesses. So someone who manufactures or cultivates may not have a financial interest in a testing laboratory because it's very important that the testing laboratories maintain their independence. Uh, the type 10 is the retailer, type 11 is the distributor, and type 12 is a fully integrated micro business, a vertically integrated micro business, which includes two or more of the other license types, typically a cultivation, a manufacturing, and also a retail component all under one roof. So that's a little bit about, about the, um, the types of licenses, the types of businesses and sort of the supply chain. Beyond that, I'd like to talk a little bit about the licensing process. Right now, both Fullerton and Costa Mesa are sort of in this process right now. Um, the first process is the city typically will have study sessions and an ad hoc committee and They'll take community input and industry input, and they'll consider passing an ordinance. In doing so, um, there's definitely consideration to uh, where uh, the facilities should be located. As Chad mentioned, some of the uh, some of the cities want to have dispensaries uh, located not in the ordinary retail zone. Other cities want dispensaries and or other cannabis businesses to be in a certain part of town where they feel that it's less likely to impact youth or whatnot. Each city also is entitled to determine what the sensitive uses are that these facilities need to be kept away from. So typically cities will restrict uh, dispensaries from and manufacturing facilities uh, and grow facilities from uh, from being too close to schools, typically 600 feet, parks, youth centers, sometimes churches. Um, so there's each city is entitled to consider what those sensitive use receptors are or would be and how far away from each one of those um, uses this facility would have to be and how to measure that distance is another consideration. Um, once the city passes an ordinance, there's an application process and those who are interested in opening up these businesses have to acquire real estate um, and a location. Um, and then they need to go through a merit-based, typically either a merit-based or some other type of selection process where they're graded on their on their bids they have to provide a security plan um, they have to have security guards on premises detailed policies and procedures odor policies and odor mitigation um, they need to provide for uh, safety of the community and in many cases they're asked to be provide for a community benefits plan and many of these businesses um, as part of their, their bid um, offer to become you know, involved in, in providing a charity or charitable contributions or uh, providing employment opportunities uh, within the community internship programs. And so the city then evaluates the, sorry, the city then evaluates the applicants 
and makes a selection, uh, then they must, you know, go through the ordinary building permit process, uh, depending on the type of business uh, that's involved. If it's a manufacturing or a volatile manufacturing, that's going to be very heavily involved with fire department intervention uh, because you're dealing with volatile chemicals. So each business has its own challenges and they must submit very detailed permits uh, and, and building plans to the city and get those approved. And then ultimately, when all of that is completed, they then can approach the state and apply for a state license. And if they've been municipally approved, the state generally approves that license as a matter of right. Uh, there's really no competitive process at the state level. The competitive process is at the municipal level. With that in mind, I just sort of wanted to share that right now in Cal, this is an old chart from a few years ago, but in general, these are sort of the hot spots of the cities that have licensed retail stores. And there's a huge, you know, lack of outlets of places that people can buy, safely buy regulated cannabis. And the problem is that in those cities where you don't have licensed facilities, you have a plethora of unlicensed facilities that are meeting these people, the consumers needs, and it's leading to the, um, you know, continuation of, uh, of the, you know, unlicensed, uh, uh, you know, economy and, and the black market, which is really what we're trying to get rid of. So we talked about this sort of, this is a more recent chart with, uh, with sort of showing that as of the end of 2019, there were 390 uh, cities that don't allow cannabis at all on the retail level and only 85 that do. You know, every few months and a few other cities come online, but it's been a very slow process. And for the most part, most cities are not allowing uh, cannabis businesses at all, let alone retail sales. I wanted to show you a couple of examples of, of cannabis businesses that I've been involved with, that I've been an owner uh, of, and that I've helped to found. And this is one of my earliest ones, OC3. And the reason I want to show you these is just to show you how clean, how professional, uh, in many cases, these are multi-million dollar projects. There's a huge investment uh, put put out in terms of building these out uh, and operating them. So I wanted to just show you, this is Bud and Bloom, my very first dispensary in Santa Ana, uh, which has won multiple awards for design. And I just kind of want to give you a sense. These are very high-end retail stores. A lot of money is put in. The employees are paid very, very well. There's a lot of opportunities for invest advancement. Uh, my shops are union organized. Um, there's benefits, both health insurance, 401ks. So this is a sustainable uh, business um, and it's generating good jobs at a time that we need that, especially in our retail economy. So these are just some examples of stores that I uh, have an ownership interest. I work with several cannabis companies uh, one of them is called Cookies. They're a member of the chamber um, and um, they have uh, a chain of retail stores throughout the United States. This just shows you the tremendous design aesthetic uh, of their stores. Um, the, these products that, that are displayed for the customers are tethered to the table. So there's security measures in place. They're discreet. And yet, um, you know, the products are displayed in a very nice manner uh, that allow customers to, to, to see and interact and learn about the products. I also work for Shrine Group, the same group that, uh, that uh, Chad works for uh, on behalf. And this is a project that we presently have pending in the city of Oxnard that will hopefully get approved. Um, in a very, very large retail center. So one of the things we like about many of the new cities that are bringing cannabis online is that they, they understand that it's a retail use just like any other retail use and for the safety and convenience of the customers and to make these businesses successful, this particular project 
is in the same center as a big five, a Carl's Jr., a Circle K, and it has 280 parking spots. So these are the kind of compelling retail projects that are safe, easy to access, um, create good high paying jobs. And that's what the industry is trying to accomplish. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to, and, and maybe I guess we're gonna answer some questions. Thank you, gentlemen. It was really insightful and very illuminating, I believe. I'm hoping that a few more people will put questions in the chat room, but I had a question for either of you, and Chad, you might be most qualified to answer it. Um, we had a great deal of conversation about taxation and taxation in different communities, and I believe you mentioned that Santa Ana was generating $9 billion in um, tax revenue from their um, cannabis sales. Are there regulations on what percentage of tax is charged by local municipalities and do they keep that entire tax within their community? There, yeah, there, there are, each city will determine the tax rate. So as Aaron mentioned, some businesses are taxed at the state level and then cities can also add, or counties if but business is located in unincorporated can add an additional tax. And um, so that tax will go to the city. So there you bring up an interesting question of county regulations. So the County of Orange, in addition to the individual cities within the county could decide as a county that they in the unincorporated areas would allow certain uses, correct? Right, they could. In those areas, um, it's not uncommon to have what's called a county island. There are several of them in Orange County. Um, the area that people call North Tustin is a good example. There's a, a large one in uh, Placentia, actually. And these are areas that we think are part of a city, but they've never actually been incorporated. So their government is, their, basically their city council is the county board of supervisors. So the county could approve a cannabis use and, um, you know, at that point, they would regulate it. They would be in the role of the city. So they'd set up their own guidelines and their own uh, taxation scheme. Thank you. I also had a question regarding the testing labs. Are they labs that are used for other testing or are they exclusive to cannabis? And what level of education and who is providing the education to those people who are working in those testing labs? I can take that if you want, Chad. Yeah. The, the, these labs are particular to cannabis. Um, they must be licensed uh, by the state. Uh, and um, they, uh, the, the stand, there's no national standards. Uh, I think that different groups are trying to develop standards for testing, but the state uh, does, you know, require the labs to, to uh, have very rigid and rigorous policies and procedures in place. Um, and um, they uh, require batch testing of the product. So not every bit of product is tested. They'll, the, 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 the cultivators uh, will send in uh, samples uh, from, from each batch. Uh, then when a product is then subsequently manufactured, that manufacturer then needs to also retest that product again uh, in its manufactured form. Um, and these labs specialize, they use uh, mass spectrography, I believe, and other, you know, very well uh, established methods of, of testing that, but, but I don't think there's any kind of national standards. There is a list of uh, requirements for the various pesticides that are that are prohibited, um, and there are standards that the state prescribes in terms of what levels of mold or pesticide might be allowed in the final uh, product. Great, thank you so much, Erin. And then my other um, question has back to permits, and I know that I've been monitoring some of the some of the discussions at the Fullerton City Council level certainly with the distances from churches and schools and other retail establishments and um, neighborhoods, residences, et cetera. Um, in the cities that have approved cannabis um, 
retail, are they requiring conditional use permits from these businesses or other types of, of permits only? Generally, a CUP is the is kind of the standard. Not all cities use the same terminology, um, but that's typically the process. Is it's a permit with conditions, um, so that you would have the the CUP, and then you'd also have your standard building permits. Um, so they'd be they'd be subject to the same requirements as any other business that's doing tenant improvements or or build outs. And then a conditional use permit as education, uh, as entertainment or some restaurants and those types of things. So I just, it's curious just to see the amount of regulations that really are in place for a business that might want to operate in this fashion. In many cases, there's, there's, uh, there's a, each city determines the exact process that they'll license the, the businesses. Um, some have a minor permit type of process. Others ha leave the permitting completely with city staff. Um, some cities allow for an unlimited number of permits. Others place a cap. Um, typically, uh, there's uh, the most competition and the most difficult to obtain permit is the retail uh, storefront dispensary. Oftentimes, you'll have 80 applicants for five potential stores. Um, all of those applicants have to prepare extremely detailed proposals that run into hundreds of pages uh, with policies, procedures, architectural rendering, security plans. Uh, they have to lock down real estate and oftentimes uh, they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to pursue a project, uh, which only ultimately five out of 50 might get licensed. Uh, yeah, it can well, it can be quite for it can it's it's a very extensive process, not just for the applicants, but also for city staff. Um, there are groups out there that will just apply to city after city after city. They've without any experience um, or any real track record. Um, you know, everybody, every business that has a permit has got their first permit at some point. Um, <clears throat> but when you've got a city staff that's having to wade through 80 applications that are reaching 50 plus pages on each one and, and doing the review. Most cities do not meet their timelines, uh, their original timeline as far as when they will issue applications or make the selection, uh, because it's just, it can be a really grueling process for the city staff. So there are, there are ways to kind of um, indirectly limit the number of applicants, um, you know, by requiring things like, uh, you know, you, you have to have an existing operation already. So the city can see if they wanted to, they could actually go and see the operation in existence. They can uh, get reports on the tax revenue that's generated. So if they're going to make an approval, if they're going to let a business come in and operate, they kind of know what they're getting. And th those sort of requirements can kind of filter out um, the groups that either don't have the ability to really operate or, uh, you know, or don't have the experience. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you to those of you who had the opportunity to tune in today for with us. I hope you're able to come back on February 25th as we discuss K-12 education in a COVID environment, the challenges, opportunities, and lessons learned. So with that, again, thank you to our special guests today. I look forward to following this issue as we all join together to promote businesses within our community to make sure our communities remain vibrant and safe for all involved. So thank you very much and have a great long weekend. Bye-bye now. Thanks, Teresa. Thank Thanks you. So Bye-bye.